what is up everybody and we are on to tier three now as you can probably see from the video title this is not going to be the entire tier three and i'm sorry about that but my reasoning for it is this we are past most of the standard theories and a lot of the stuff we're getting into now is either super like old world spiritual or crazy ideas in physics or these theories and places you've never heard of that i've got to go into explanation on so it was either going to have to be i'll skimp out on theories and not explain as much which is lame or i'll have to post the entire tier at once which could be an hour or more and it would be longer between uploads which is also lame or i break the tiers up in half so sorry that this isn't the whole thing but this will let me get them out faster. Uh, we're still gonna go through it the same. And I can explain each concept more, which I think since no one else is doing this type of thing, you all would probably prefer. Also to request that I'm following through on, the original picture of the iceberg will be in the description. So if you wanna read along or skip ahead to anything, go ahead. I'm not gonna do it uh, on here because some people like to be surprised by what comes next. But if you want the original picture, it's down there. And also, people have asked me to talk louder, so I am certainly going to try <laughs> to keep track of all of this because there's going to be more and more videos piling up, especially since they're now in half, at least from here on until something changes. Uh, there's also going to be a playlist on my channel, so if you ever get behind or anything, you can just go there and make sure that you're watching them all in order. I will be starting another series called A Deeper Dive, uh, probably not till this is over, maybe one or two before this is over where if there is a specific concept you want to see highlighted more uh, because trust me like any of these from here on out i could do an entire video on just comment it below and in this new series a deeper dive i will do exactly that and go further into detail on these iceberg ideas also for some of the more controversial ones that i'm going to mention and get into as i'm doing this uh, i've decided that on my patreon podcast that we are going to be doing a couple episodes talking of the more controversial ones uh, that I can't mention on YouTube. So if you're a patron, stay tuned for that. Let's get into it, but before we do that, I want to say sincerely from the bottom of my heart, thank you. My channel is doing better now than it ever has. Uh, I'm near a thousand subscribers, which is absolutely insane. And it's all thanks to you guys. So I really do mean it. Thank you for watching. Tier three is titled as the truth agent. Uh, and its definition is point of no return. Some of this knowledge will make you appear and act like a lunatic to normal people's eyes, but it's only the beginning. If you are still here, you might want to study and research more following your path. First up is singularity. Singularity has two base definitions. Uh, the first is the idea of an infinite zero in an equation. So in things such as a black hole, uh, density is calculated infinitely, which is the reason a black hole exists. However, uh, the version that I think the theory is referring to, because there's more reference to this type of thing in this tier, is the idea that humanity will eventually reach a point of no return with technology, meaning that at some point we will either develop ourselves to such a dependence on technology or to a point that AI will be equal to humanity and there will be no coming back from it. So uh, there are theories that we've already hit that singularity point or that we are very quickly about to. And this relates to ideas on both sides of transhumanism, who think that's a good thing, and people who believe that technology has progressed too far and that we should quit while we're ahead. Quantum suicide and immortality is a tricky one to understand, but I'm going to try to do my best to you. Uh, I'm going to need to explain some ideas in quantum mechanics, so bear with me. I am not a physicist, but I will do my best. The word quantum itself refers to super, super small microscopic particles. I am talking pieces of atoms as they move around. What's interesting about atoms and electrons and things such as is that we never know at one point where they are. They're constantly moving, never setting still. So what that means is that we always predict where they'll be or have an idea of the estimation of where they'll be. Obviously, this is very different from real world logic. I can point at you or a thing at the wall or the Travis Scott vinyl back there and know for sure that it is there, that it is a tangible object. However, you can't do that with atoms. What's interesting is that this doesn't just apply to one atom. It applies to two atoms or three or four in clusters. So there has to be a point somewhere where atoms quit being atoms that are judged quantumly and begin becoming objects that can be judged logically. This goes back to the whole idea of a sand pile, that if you have a heap of sand and you periodically take one grain of sand out, it never quits being a heap. But by that logic, by the time you get down to one bit of sand, that's still technically a heap, unless there's some rule that changes it somewhere. 
All this really has to do with thought experiments and theories and things such as. And quantum suicide and immortality itself is one of these thought experiments. If we apply quantum mechanics to real large world creations such as humans or chairs or what have you, that's where we get into ideas like Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat is the idea that if you were to take a cat and to put it in a box, then inside this box there was a mechanism that had a 50% chance of killing the cat. The cat would be both dead and alive until observed. Now remember, this is all applying to quantum mechanics. So if the way atoms work are, we don't know how they are until we look at it at a specific moment and say, oh, that's it, then something larger, like a cat, would have the same rules applied to it. So by Schrodinger's cat logic or Schrodinger's law, things in the real world are not manipulated until you look at them. But obviously that isn't true because things can happen without us directly looking at it. The inverse to Schrodinger's law is something called Copenhagen's law. Copenhagen's law states that if something happens in our world, then that is the only thing that happens. That there was a series of random events that could occur that led to this specific instance occurring, and that's it. That's all she wrote, that there's only one way it happens. Uh, so again, it kind of goes back against Schrodinger's law, but it is a more normal idea for us. Like, that's essentially how things work in the real world. Things happen or they don't. Quantum suicide and immortality is a theory that kind of straddles between the two. It was developed by a man named Hugh Everett, who was, from everything I found, kind of a jerk. Uh, for example, his daughter attempted suicide, and he simply glanced up from his notebook and thought nothing of the situation. He was a very callous man, and this is a very callous look at reality. It takes the idea of Schrodinger's cat, that there are unknown uncertainties when it comes to how things react in the real world, and we only change it by observation, and applies Copenhagen's law that whatever happens in our world is simply what happened, and that's how the dice fell. Quantum suicide and immortality is very closely related to what we know as string theory, or the idea that there are multiple expanding universes in every direction. It says that every single one of these unknown uncertainties is played out in a different universe. Uh, those familiar with string theory will know what I'm talking about. Every decision that you could make is made in a separate branching off pathway and this goes on infinitely forever for everyone. Quantum suicide and immortality is applying this to the person, saying that if you are a depressed individual or if you are a very lively happy individual, every single change in your character will be played out across these different timelines, which means there are some where you always commit suicide, and this is rather dark, but like I said, he was a callous man, or there are some where you live forever. His thought process on this being, if you live to be 100 and your heart simply stops, well, there's a branching off universe where your heart goes a second longer and another one where it goes a second longer and on and on and on, which means there are infinite universes where you commit suicide or die forever and ones where you live on forever, forever in these branching pathways. I really hope that wasn't boring. I thought it was a really cool concept, so yeah. The tree swastika was discovered in Germany in 1992, in which 140 large trees were planted in the pattern of a swastika. The significance of large trees is that they share similarities in color and design with the other trees of the area year-round, except for a three-week window in the winter in which they become brown with their leaves, and as you can see in the picture, create a different pattern when planted between them, in this case, a swastika. What's interesting about these trees, given how tall they are, is that they would have to be planted a long time ago. And what's even more interesting is that this isn't the only one. There have been several found across Germany, Poland, France, and things such as, which it's believed during World War II that uh, Nazi sympathizers or Nazi commanders in certain regions would plant these as a show of good faith or loyalty to the fatherland and blah, 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 what have you. It's interesting that these monuments or natural monuments to an empire since defeated can still appear randomly in the real world. And it's scary to think of how much deeper ideas like this go than we're publicly aware of. Genocide denials goes to both sides as there will be public opinion that denies uh, sort of publicly accepted ideas of genocide and things that have happened. And there will also be governments who deny accusations towards them of their involvement in genocide, and so on and so forth that goes both ways. Rocco's Basilisk is another thought experiment that comes from an online user who went by the name of Rocco. He developed the idea 
that if AI is to come to a point of singularity or to where it gets so powerful that it's smarter than us and starts to kill us, it would be beneficial now to help it. Because after this AI becomes so super intelligent, it may begin killing people who weren't part of its creation. While this is already kind of a logical fallacy, the whole idea of you have to do evil to prevent evil from happening to you and blah, blah, blah. What's interesting about it is some of the more hypothetical theories that it gets into. Uh, and there's so many I won't go into them, but ideas that this AI may, since it can manipulate time, go back in time and simply stop be people from being born who wouldn't help it. So everyone that's alive now is people that would only help it. Or that the AI itself has simply come back in time to silently watch and see what people will lead to its creation and so on and so forth. It's essentially a cautionary tale about AI. And while this is a more submissive answer to it, like we gotta help it or else, um, it's used in a lot of circles about the dangers of AI itself. Torrid is a really cool one I remember hearing about uh, several years back, specifically the man from Torrid, as it's called. The story goes like this. A man entered a Japanese airport and was caught at exchange because his passport was weird. It said that he was from a country called Torrid and it had his full information, date of birth, all of it was correct except the country of origin. The security pulled him to the side and began asking him questions about this country, to which the man was confused and kept replying that he's simply from Torrid. As a matter of fact, he pointed to it on a map, saying that that map was incorrect because it's supposed to reside between Germany and France. He gave correct accounts of information through history, like World War II and the uh, Soviet Cold War. He gave numbers for them to call, which all proved to be non-existent, and this lasted for some time. That night, the security put him in a hotel so that they could figure out what to do, and the next day when they went to get him, he was gone. There was no evidence of him, there was no information found, and he was never seen again. A lot of this relates back to the Mandela Effect that I mentioned in the first here. There are these parallel universes that keep interacting with one another, but it's interesting the idea that there is a different, slightly different world from ours. It still had events like Cold War and World War II, but resulted in the creation of a new country called Torrid. The bloop is something that personally affects me because it has to do with my worst fear ever, the ocean. In the early 2000s, uh, ocean researchers had several microphones placed across the Pacific Ocean, the purpose of it to be to monitor uh, blue whale migrations. That was until, out of nowhere, from a location that was triangulated to be the bottom of the ocean, there was a bellowing roar that was so loud, it was picked up by microphones in a 3,000 mile radius direction. To put that in perspective, the vocal cords of whatever this thing would had to be three times the size, at least, of a blue whale. To this day, no one knows where it came from, and it has been the subject of several conspiracies or monster theories about things that live beneath the ocean, which is just further confirmation to me that I don't belong in the ocean. Rosicrucianism is closely related to an old religion that was a branch off of uh, Christianity some 800 years ago known as Gnosticism, or Gnosticism, not sure how to pronounce it. It essentially follows the idea that God and the Trinity is real from Christianity, but that there are lesser gods, and each of them are mandated to do different things. Uh, more specifically, the idea that the lesser god that created Earth is evil and mischievous, and that's why there's so much sin and misery on our Earth. While good things come from Christ and the Godhead, bad things come from our smaller god. Rosicrucianism, from everything that I can find, uh, believes this theory but applies more science into it. Where this applies is that almost everything I found about Rosicrucianism applies to the Masons. The idea being that several of the founders of the Freemasons uh, subscribe to this ideology, and we're not only that, but we're sort of high priest in this order. So the idea of digital Christianity mixed with uh, phenomenal science creating the Freemasons stays in line with most of the theories that apply to them. Sinkholes are exactly what uh, it's referring to, sinkholes. For those that don't know, uh, periodically, especially in man-made areas, giant holes in the ground can open up, and I mean huge. It doesn't just have to be wherever man-made items are, but that's normally where it happens. A lot of the theories around this go back to the idea of gods and stuff, that uh, we have overpopulated the earth too much and so it's cleansing itself, or back to harmonic vibrations on the earth, and you know, make your own calculations from it. But that's just what the theory is referring to. The Publius Enigma 
dates back to Pink Floyd's 1994 album, The Division Bell. Someone by the name of Publius appeared online and began saying that there was a secret message hidden in the album, The Division Bell, and anyone that figured it out would be given great reward. Now, while you could just chalk this up to some crazy person on boards, they seem to know a whole lot about Pink Floyd and the album itself, and when questioned about their legitimacy, they said to watch the stage at the next Pink Floyd concert, to which the lights began flashing in code uh, the name of Publius. So obviously this guy has connections somewhere. Despite this, there has never been any huge secret, at least from what I can find, derived from the Division Bell album, and most people believe it to be some huge sort of like paparazzi show from the agents who put together the album, but everyone exclusively denies this. So who is Publius and what's the secret of the Division Bell? Russian sleep experiments are a supposed uh, experiment that was uncovered that happened in Russia during World War II. And while you may be familiar with the famous creepypasta that I was before looking into it, the creepypasta comes off of the supposed real world documentation. The idea of this experiment was to develop a drug that would give soldiers the ability to stay awake for days at a time without side effects or crashing. However, according to the legend, what happened during these experiments is that as the days progressed, the test subjects became more and more insane to the point that they completely lost touch with humanity and became these groveling monsters that asked for pain and wanted to hurt each other and they ripped someone's throat out and yada 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 goes on and on. There are logs of this which you can look up and read yourself of supposedly what happened. There's a lot of gore and violence involved. Uh, but it all relates back to the idea that whenever we sleep, we stave off this inner demon that we all have inside of us. And without sleep for weeks at a time, we allow it to become more powerful till eventually it takes over. It all relates to the overarching concept of the evil within every human. Esoteric knowledge is kind of broad. From everything that I've found, it has to do with human intentions. So esoteric knowledge would be a true understanding of what it is in your brain that makes you do the things you do or behave the way that you are. Esotericism is mentioned a lot in things like Gnosticism or Rosicrucianism and other old religions that are kind of the development for a lot of conspiracies. The Denver airport is an interesting one which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. For one, the layout of the Denver airport makes absolutely no sense. The way it's built with its hallways that go seemingly nowhere and terminals that are completely separate from everything else doesn't make a lot of sense on the outside. However, when you look at old plans that had the idea of there being a giant underground and there supposedly isn't one, it comes to the theory that it is a secret bunker, either by the military or some say the Illuminati and things such as. But the theory just doesn't stop there. For one, there are some really weird art pieces around the Denver airport. For example, there is a painting of a German Nazi in a gas mask with rainbows coming out of him in a giant scythe as well as a statue outside of a 32 foot tall horse that is blue with red glowing eyes that people refer to as Blucifer, which during its construction, the head fell off, killing the creator, to which they put the head back on and left it. And on top of that, uh, there are signs all over the Denver airport that says it was created by the Freemasons and it's a Mason establishment and blah, blah, blah. And uh, theories range from the idea of Denver Airport being the gateway to hell uh, to just the idea that it's a secret military or Freemason base that is kept quiet from the public. Archons relate back to Gnosticism, which I mentioned earlier. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Essentially, if the lesser god created our world, the Archons are his helpers or tormentors. And it goes to the idea that mischievous or evil things that happen in the real world are the deliberate actions of these tiny demons. Uh, I say tiny demons, essentially it's just demons working for a different entity than the devil. So you could be safe to say these are the demons of Gnosticism. Spirit science is exactly what it says. The idea that scientific concepts can be related to spiritualism and things like auras and chakras and things such as, and that through application of spirit science you can unlock or understand your inner self. The plane of jars is interesting. Uh, in Laos, there are these fields that are all grouped together that hold anywhere between one to 400 of these giant nine foot wide stone jars. They've all been carved out from stone. Most of them have lids with them 
and they're just sitting in these fields and no one knows where they came from. The locals in the area talk of legends and say that giants used to roam this land. And there's again giants being mentioned from the past years. And that what they would do is they would carve out these stones and set them in these fields and that's where they'd keep their alcohol and honey and things such as. And each field was a different keeping place for a different material. Sadly, not a lot of research or insight can be done to this place because during Vietnam, the United States dropped more uh, explosives on specifically the field of jars than the entirety of World War II. Uh, and that combined with all of the undetonated explosives there mean research is very, very scant and dangerous to do. So I guess we may not know more about this, but I like the giant's idea, it's cool. The Beacon of Hate was discovered on June the 2nd of 2000, in which a man in the Western United States uh, began picking up on this radio transmission that was being broadcast locally uh, and after enhancing it he found a looping broadcast in which someone was screaming over and over about America selling themselves to camels and pornography and religion should die and the end times is coming with a chariot and other mixes of like revelations type speak and uh, general disdain for the United States, so on and so forth. This was looping for, as far as he could tell, about eight months before it disappeared. Uh, to this day, the FCC has better things to do. There have been no information found on it, no one knows who caused it or what happened, and it simply remains a mystery. Feral children is a real-world phenomenon which is quite sad, in which kids who either ran away or were abducted at a young age and lived away from human contact uh, simply became feral. This is observed a lot whenever researchers go to lesser um, populated areas such as forests and jungles in which children have been allowed to get away from their families and been raised in the wilderness. Normally the child is very either scared of human interaction or violent around humans and resolves to things such as running on all fours, but it can also result in some very interesting side effects such as uh, different form bone structure and nasal pathways that uh, are simply just, you know, evidence of adaptation in humans. It's interesting, however, that uh, when taken away from other human contact in these sort of case studies, that we become animalistic. Antinatalism is a more recent ideology. Uh, natalism is the idea that having children is good and, you know, having a baby is good. Whereas antinatalism is the opposite of that and says that having a child is morally bad. The idea with this theory being that if the higher ups or Illuminati or whatever have you is trying to dissolve the family unit, then this idea of antinatalism will be put out more and more across the human populace until eventually families or having children or things such as is seen as a natural bad. Charles Fort is someone that I wish that I knew about before getting into this because he seems like an interesting individual. He wrote several fiction books which had to do with uh, different occurring phenomena such as uh, teleportation, human combustion, ball lightning, etc. What's more interesting is ideas such as teleportation and ball lightning he's actually credited with inventing. What goes furthermore is in that most interviews where he talked about these phenomena, he simply said that in studying real world phenomena, they are things that he observed. The idea with this being that because of Charles Ford's writings, we have highlights to some things that really do happen such as human combustion, teleportation randomly, ball lightning, so on and so forth. To the point that a term given to real world supernatural events is Fortean, such as giant uh, unexplainable monsters can be called Lovecraftian. Also everything else I found on Charles Fort generally relates back to the occult, with several sort of scientific occult circles claiming him as one of their founders. The Road to Ruda was a comic book put out by the federal government for school children in the 1980s. The point of this book was to teach children concepts such as scarcity and market value and things such as. However, a man by the name of Bix Weir uh, later came out with his own theory regarding the comic. His idea is that large governments are getting tired of banking circles owning the world through their amounts of money they loan out and things such as, and it all has to get back to Wall Street and uh, national banking circles and blah, blah, blah. But his idea is the comic is showing a federal idea to get back to a new gold standard. Or the idea that after a great reset, so to speak, which is being talked about a lot now in the news, um, that we could reverse our current banking circle idea and return to a second gold standard, as he calls it. Mereological nihilism 
is another one of those thought concepts. It's the idea that there are no things that are composed of other things. They are simply the smaller things made into bigger things. What I mean by that is there's no such thing as a chair. There are pieces of wood in straight lines that are pointed together in chair fashion. While this whole thing seems kind of pointless in that regard, uh, as you apply that more and more to people and biology and things such as, uh, it becomes more of an idea of this sort of nihilism when it comes to science and humanity. The Kagets were interesting considering I had literally never heard about this until starting review for this. The Kagets were a race of people in 16th and 17th century France who were horribly discriminated against. And by horribly, I mean that whenever entering the town, they had to ring a bell like a leper to let other people know they're around. Not only that, but they had to walk with shoes on at all times or be arrested, so that way their skin didn't touch the ground that other barefoot people had to walk on. They were not allowed to farm. One Kaget who tried to, on his own land, had stakes run through his feet and they had to use a specific font when riding, that way people would know a Kaget rode it. If they didn't, as happened to one man, he had his hand cut off and pinned to the church door. And there were several rumors that spread up about them, like because they wore shoes all the time, people said that they had webbed feet, or because they only rode in one font, children would say that that's because they have the devil's handwriting. What's really weird is no one knows where they came from. Uh, they seemingly look like any other French person. The ideas were they came from a defeated army during the goth period way, way back, uh, but that can't be confirmed. Ideas are that they are people from north of the English Channel who came south and were simply shamed against, but that can't be confirmed. So seemingly this race just pops up in France, is horribly hated, and then disappears. It wasn't until the French Revolution in which several Kagets went to record offices and burned any information that they were Kagets uh, and simply assimilated back into French society. Deep Sea Lab text relates to real experiments that happened called Sea Lab, which were carried out by the United States Navy. The idea was to place these science capsules in different spots around the ocean for researchers to live in and do research from. Uh, the first two went off without a hitch. However, the third one during its setup uh, someone went down to fix a carbon monoxide poisoning problem and died in the process, so the Navy shut the entire thing down. The theory is that these experiments are still being carried out in secret for whatever reason, and the idea that it was kept out of public eye, not because someone died, but because they wanted to start research on something the public shouldn't be aware of. However, I think the biggest travesty that come from that is that the people who went down into these bases were called aquanauts, and we need to bring that back. Hitler escaped inside the Earth, is relating back to what I've talked about in previous tiers known as Agartha. The idea being that the Nazis at this base 221 that were supposedly looking for Agartha, which keep in mind would be the entire Earth's inside, found it, made tunnels that led up to Berlin and Germany, and whenever Germany began losing the war, Hitler uh, simply went underground into this underworld. So if you were to get to the secret plane of Agartha, uh, it would theoretically be Nazis and giants. So do with that information what you will. Illuminati blood banks is exactly what it says. There are real world programs where the rich can buy the blood of the young in order to get transfusions for it to ideally make them younger. And there are things like blood facials that people do and we are living in a dystopia. However, Illuminati blood banks just says that this secret Illuminati organization has near infinite supplies for these for their members so that they can always harvest the blood of the young to stay fit which I hate to admit is one of the least outlandish on this entire list. Sacred geometry is that the idea that there are certain shapes and patterns uh, in geometry that relate to the construction of the real world, so much so that God himself would be the geometric shape of life itself. And it gets into this whole idea that certain shapes can be used to summon different things and so on and so forth. The Black Pope Prophecy comes from a supposed prediction that popped up in the 1500s, specifically 1590, that was 112 phrases to describe every pope in existence. Not only everyone that had came before, that everyone that was coming afterwards. Whoever made this is often switched around with people saying it being different saints or bishops in the church. This eventually leads to a final pope, which it says will bring the fall of Rome. However, this one, from everything I found, is pretty fake. Like, it had all of them right up until 1590 when it was written, and then after that none of them made any sense applied to different popes, so whatever. DMT beans 
is the fact that while on DMT, several different individuals have these shared hallucinations of something called clockwork elves, which appear as these tall, silvery, slender creatures that watch over them while they're high. Not only that, but there are several shared hallucinations involving syntax and life and blah, blah, blah. Don't do drugs. The Missing Children Forest refers to a 700,000 acre forest in LA County, uh, Los Angeles, in which children have gone missing with no evidence found afterwards. Originally, there was about eight kids that went missing and was later pinned on a serial killer in the area, but since then he's been in jail and people have still gone missing in this forest, to the point that dozens of kids simply walk into the woods and never return. This can lead to tons of speculation, but it all traces back to the idea of what in these woods is drawing kids in and what's making them not be found. Solipsism is the concept that nothing outside of your own mind can be known. For example, we could all be in the matrix right now and everything we see be fake. We could be in alternate realities and everything that we see is an illusion, blah, blah, blah. But the only thing you can know for sure is your mind. The fact that you are having thoughts right now and that you created these thoughts is the only thing that can be known for sure. And it is the base theory for the famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. Thule is a concept that has been traced back to the early Greeks. In the idea that on all their maps they had this region located far to the north known as Thule in which they said that's where sea monsters came from, uh, that's where these giants came from, etc, etc. There's different theories about well maybe it was Ireland or maybe it was Norway uh, and whatever have you, but what's interesting is it's never been exactly laid down and while all of the Greeks had sort of this unified idea of what Thule was and what was there, we can't find anything that exactly matches it in our modern text. So. Maybe it's something that uh, sank below ground in a plate shift, or maybe it's something that never existed. Who knows? Der Glocke is German for the bell and refers to secret Nazi super weapon research that occurred in World War II. Theories for this include things such as the Wunderwaffe or the Schrunergewehr, which is German for wonder weapon or sun rifle. The ideas for this being that the Germans were looking ways to concentrate radiation into these centralized waves as a form of attack, or electricity itself in these sort of like long-range tasers. Not only that, but there were records of them looking into teleportation and how to move people instantly over large distances. They were looking for these giant air plug cannons that would fire a piece of air large enough to take out planes, uh, and it goes on. But this whole de Glocke just relates to the idea that these Germans had working models for these things and that the reason they've been kept so secretive is because after the Allies won the war, they wanted to use that research themselves. And that's it for part one of tier three. I will try to get the second part of tier three out as soon as possible. Uh, but once again, just thank you guys for watching. It really does mean the most. Special thank you to all of my subscribers and especially all of my patrons. A very special thank you to my top tier patrons. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Peth. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Publius. And thank you, Saucy. Link will be in the description as always. I really do mean it, guys. Thank you for watching. Uh, it's amazing to see the growth that I've had for as small as I am. I'm going to keep doing this. Hopefully, a deeper dive will be fun and you all will enjoy that. But uh, again, just thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next one.